Uh, hello and uh, welcome to the evidencenetwork.ca webinar uh, on reporting on health. My name's Dr. John Lister. Um, I'm a PhD doctor, not a medical doctor, and I've been reporting on uh, uh, health policy and health uh, care issues in the, in the United Kingdom, in England in particular, for the last 30 years. I'm an associate senior lecturer in the Department of Media in Coventry University. I teach print journalism, journalism at BA level, and I also do Bachelor of Art level, and I also teach uh, masters in health journalism. Thank you again for joining the webinar. So the f general topic is reporting on health, and I suppose we start with why, that, why that's important. And... Um, well, first off, you know, it's an abundant field for stories. I mean, there's hardly any news publication, news broadcast that doesn't at some point have something related to health in it. Healthcare is the world's biggest industry. It has a turnover in excess. This is a several years old figure of $5 trillion uh, around the world. It's the world's biggest employer, I think, in the region of 50 to 60 million employees around the world. This makes it a very big political issue in every country because it consumes huge amounts of resources. Uh, the way those resources are used and allocated become big political questions uh, which concern people on a day-to-day -day basis. I know in opinion polls in the UK, uh, health care is consistently one of the top two, three or four concerns of, of, of voters when election uh, polls are taken and so forth. Um, so so it's, a bit, it's a big deal that way around. But it's also got different aspects to it. You've got local issues of health care, access to health care, particular changes and pressures on healthcare systems. You've got regional issues, uh, or in the case of Canada, I suppose you look at provincial issues uh, where, you know, you've got particular ethnic uh, issues, particular combinations of uh, problems, geographical problems, climatic problems that cause particular pressures and, change, uh, and put particular stresses on healthcare systems. You've got national issues, different national healthcare systems, which ones work better, which ones don't work so well, what lessons can be learned from one national healthcare system to another. You've got international questions about the availability of, uh, of technology on an international level, the sharing of, of, of resources uh, and so forth. You've got global uh, projects which actually set out to, for example, uh, improve immunization and other uh, things in developing countries and so forth. And um, it's also obviously a very substantial social issue. Um, I think uh, you're very much aware of this in Canada. It defines a national culture compared to your neighbours to the south who haven't yet uh, got to the level of civilization you have in terms of access uh, to health care and a Medicare system that enables access uh, to health care for all. So, again, uh, uh, important from that point of view. Of course, you have also the proliferation of scientific stories. It's a massive area for scientific uh, uh, exp uh, um, uh, 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 experimentation, new techniques, new drugs, uh, and so forth, tests on existing uh, treatments, and so on. Uh, we have a newspaper back home called the Daily Mail and another one called the Daily Express, and they specialise in stories which alternate between things that cause cancer and things that uh, can cure cancer um, and produce this endless series of apparently scientific stories, one after the other, many of them based on clearly on press releases and material from the drug companies, from the institutions carrying out this type of research, uh, some of which may have some accurate uh, content to it, some of which is clearly uh, slightly exaggerated, to say the least. And it's very confusing, because if you drop a list of the things that cause and don't cause cancer, or the things that cure cancer, you quite often find the same things on both lists, and so on. And, uh, you know, there's no real consistency in the way this is done. But it's important because, you know, the way these things are reported can make a very significant difference. We've got at home at the moment an outbreak of, uh, of measles in South Wales, uh, which followed on the stories about the uh, apparent uh, dangers in MMR uh, vaccinations um, many years ago, which turned out to be completely spurious based on spurious research, uh, but which were used by the media uh, uh, um, very unwisely and caused a massive panic. And as a result of that, we now have children very seriously ill and dying of measles, as I say, in quite large numbers in South Wales. So this is a very serious problem. And it indicates the responsibility of a health journalist to actually check facts and check them closely uh, before uh, information is published. 
And we also have the whole question about the human interest factor in health, people who recover uh, from uh, very serious illnesses, people who are coping with very serious illness, people who are caring for people with very serious illness. The whole issue about how people manage to survive in these circumstances is an issue that interests people, is a, is a, f- a constant source of feature articles and so on. How can these be done in a way that, uh, that, that doesn't exaggerate, that actually uh, give, gives appropriate uh, knowledge and information uh, to people? Uh, will, and also issues of personal concern in terms of access to services. You know, will my grandma get treated? Um, will my grandma, uh, uh, who, when, she, when she goes into a, uh, uh, major problems, will she be over-treated? Will she be uh, subjected to all kinds of heavy intervention when actually maybe it's just that grandma has reached her time and actually needs a, to die with dignity without actually being excessively uh, subjected to medical intervention? So human interest stories as well. But we have to accept that in presenting news in the media, the reporters, editors and news media owners have a certain conflict of interest uh, with uh, objective presentation. Because journalists obviously want stories, understandably, want stories that count high in news values for their target audience. They want something that's going to make the, make the major pages, make the top spot on the pages, and so on. They, so they want, in particular, they want good news on research. They want good news stories that talk about cures, that talk about uh, breakthroughs, etc., etc. And they're quite disposed to carrying those, even possibly without necessarily going into some of the possible downsides of these new, uh, these new discoveries. Also, in many cases, and I see this uh, in my, the time I've been in Canada as well as uh, uh, back home, they're very keen on running bad news stories about the healthcare system. You know, this always makes good coverage, you know. Uh, mess here, disaster here, overspending here, chaos here, bureaucracy here. They all make great stories. They all get to people because everybody knows you're paying for healthcare one way or the other. Everybody wants to see it done right. And everybody actually is their own little expert on how it ought to be done really. Anyone who's ever been in hospital knows they could run it better than the guys who are running it and so on. So this this is an actually easy way to actually access stories. But they also want simple news. So if you've got complicated stories, stories with lots of different layers in them, (coughs) it can be difficult to... uh, provide the nuance and the, uh, and the uh, measured presentation in a story which has, had to, has to be condensed into a space of time or a certain number of words, uh, condensed into something which is uh, clearly in language and uh, accessible to the kind of target readership or target audience of the, uh, of the news outlet. So these are complications because a lot of health news is actually complicated and a lot of it can't be presented very, very, and, 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 well, it can be presented short, but it needs to be presented with great care, and, and that's not necessarily something that newsrooms are resourced to do properly. And we have the basic problems, because most journalism training, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where it's also the case, I know it's the case back, here, back home, because we've surveyed the universities, we've surveyed the courses uh, teaching journalism, we've looked at the basic core professional training of journalists in the UK, and we know that it doesn't include any more than the most rudimentary uh, reference to healthcare, and that in terms of basically the structure of the healthcare system. And in, in the case of the UK, that's almost constantly out of date because they keep changing it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so it's not generally, and, and certainly handling some of these more sophisticated scientific stories is not generally part of the journalist basic training. Some journalism courses do include, for example, handling statistics, but quite a lot of them don't, or certainly on the level that you'll need to be able to handle statistics. For example, there's the old, old thing about, you know, uh, one slice of bacon a day doubles your chances of, uh, you know, whatever it is, heart disease or, or whatever it might be. And then you go back and you look, well, what were the chances in the first place? And it's kind of, you know, 0.1% or something, and it goes up to 0.2. I'm, 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 these figures are off the top of my head. They're not accurate. But I mean, I, you have to look at what the base is before you start talking about doubling. You start talking about percentage increases. You know, we talk about percentages of very, very small surveys, of very, very small samples that are taken, and you talk about percentage increases. This is completely spurious. Basic training on how to handle statistics means that journalists should see through this, but lots of journalists don't have that basic training, and these stories still keep appearing. 
particularly in the, in the popular press where there's less resources put into uh, and, 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 and less specialist expertise in reporting these issues. Uh, surveys show that most news on health is reported by non-specialists. Well, you don't have to... Uh, it's not rocket science, this one, because even if you look at the... If you look in every, any country at the level of specialist health press, it's relatively small. In the UK, I think the total circulation of the specialist health press uh, in terms of publications is around 100,000 a, a week. Uh, but, of course, the circulation of the mass newspapers is in the millions per day. So you actually clearly, most of the news that most people get about health is written by people who don't work for specialist publications. And most of that, in turn, is written by generalist reporters who don't have specialist training in, in reporting healthcare issues. Uh, and surveys have shown this uh, in, in, in various countries. In the US, there was this survey done by, uh, for the Kaiser um, F uh, Family Foundation by uh, Gary Schweitzer and the Association of Healthcare Journalists, uh, which is available online, uh, which actually showed, again, in the U US, where actually there's slightly more uh, specialist health journalism training than there is in some other countries. Even there, most health journalism is actually written, and most, health, health, most journalists holding the health brief uh, in newsrooms were not specialists in, in, health, in health reporting. Uh, in, back home, we have the Reuters Institute, based in Oxford University. Uh, they did a similar snapshot survey of, of health specialists uh, writing for the national daily newspapers back home. And again, they found only a minority had any actual training in health-related issues. Virtually all had learned it on the job. And, uh, and so on. Now, some of them become obviously very good at it, but they, they, they do it by, by actually self-teaching on the job and it obviously can take a long time of working in that one area in order to develop that expertise. And lots of people don't get that length of time in that one area. And, of course, they can be, in the, in the meantime, required to report on quite demanding stories. We also, from the European project that I was involved in, which was funded by the European Union, it covered seven countries for this survey, uh, which was, uh, it was the UK, it was uh, uh, Greece, Germany, Finland, Estonia, uh, Romania, and um, Spain. No, uh, yes, yeah, Spain was the one that did the survey. And uh, we did a survey, again, a similar thing, of health journalists, and we found exactly the similar thing, a very, very small minority of health journalists had, had training in appropriate areas, and most of those were actually health specialists who had taken on journalism later on and hadn't necessarily been trained as journalists but had been trained in some kind of health specialty. So um, I think this is a big issue. And, uh, and even health specialists who don't have journalism training, this can be an issue as well about how you approach stories and how you actually couch stories in a way that means that these health specialists can actually write for broader audiences uh, in a way that they might not otherwise be able to do. We also have the whole question about, you know, supposing we put on this additional training, supposing we identify areas and we try to offer training to uh, journalists who um, maybe uh, redress these, uh, these problems, we have problems because, and I'm sure it's the same, in fact we were talking about this uh, just before the webinar started, in Canada it's true, in the US it's true, in the UK it's true, newsrooms are being thinned out. Employers seeking to maximise profits on publications and on broadcast, local broadcast news have really reduced the news teams to a, a bare minimum. This means it's very difficult to find the resources uh, and to find the time for someone to get the time off the job to do any training to improve their, uh, their knowledge and skills. Many journalists are already, of course, in health jobs. Those who are already health reporters have got there without the training and then they can't afford to take the time out to get the training and possibly they don't feel the need for it. They think, well, I've got this far, I know what I'm doing, uh, why do I need somebody to come along and tell me a load of stuff? And maybe, maybe that's right, maybe they do, they do know it all, but uh, you know, there's quite a few who've attended our courses who came away having at least discussed issues that you wouldn't otherwise have discussed and felt that it was worthwhile. Uh, editors also, because they generally have risen through the ranks of journalism, themselves also lack health journalism training, lack the awareness of what, what's missing, and uh, don't, don't feel obliged to, uh, uh, to do anything to improve the standards of reporting. So we need to find ways, if we're going to deliver any additional training, we need to find ways to persuade journalists uh, as individuals, as staff or freelance journalists, to give up time themselves 
and, if necessary, in some cases, to spend some money uh, to actually participate in extra training. That's a hard thing to do. Journalism, journalist pay generally isn't that great. Uh, they don't have a lot of leisure time, and so this can be a hard thing. So this partly explains... Uh, this isn't actually an excuse, but it partly explains why we've not been able to simply roll forward on the scheme that we'd set up uh, with the European project and simply roll this out as a, as a training package. Obviously, training does need to be resourced. Uh, of course, it matters because the news media are, for most people, they're the only source of information on health issues. You know, how else are you going to get it? Unless you learn it in school, you know, then as you, as you grow out in, in, in wider life, how are you going to keep up to date on what, what you should be doing, what you should do if your child gets ill at night, you know, these type of things. These type of, this type of thing, you, you're, you depend on outside sources, and a lot of that comes through the media, and a lot of information on what's happening to your local health care, where you should go if something goes wrong, uh, you know, how you should access care. These things, this news comes through the media. So it needs to be right, uh, and it needs, to be, uh, it needs to be available. Few health workers will be aware, even, you know, even health workers, the people who work in the hospitals, will be aware of what's going on outside the own, their own area they're working in. If they're nurses, they may well know about the department they're working in. They may know about the general situation of other nurses in the hospital. They're unlikely to know about the next hospital down the road, other hospitals elsewhere in the country. Maybe if they become, I don't know, union reps or professional body, on their professional bodies, they might get a more of an overview. It will still be pretty much restricted to nursing. They will still pretty much know what nurses know, and they won't necessarily have a bigger, a bigger view of what's going on. So even health workers need information about what's happening across healthcare systems. They need information about what policies are coming down the line. They need information about you know, pressures and so forth that are taking shape to understand what's happening to them. If you're working in an emergency room and you get a large influx of new patients coming, uh, much more than you had previous years, you possibly want to know if that's just you, is it just your area, is it something that's going on everywhere else. We've got this going on back home at the moment. Nobody quite can understand why except it has coincided with a whole series of, 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 um, of reforms, allegedly uh, switching services to general practitioners and primary care and uh, community services, which clearly aren't doing the job. Uh, nobody seems very willing to accept that answer. Meanwhile, the staff have to cope with this. So they would be looking to the, maybe their local press to find out what's going on. Why, why, why are we in this situation? And is anybody proposing to do anything about it, or are we just supposed to, supposed to cope? It's also a media responsibility to critique information because most people don't know how to do this. You get information, you just have to take it at face value. But you hope that somebody somewhere has asked some obvious questions. Somebody just gets a press release from a hospital or from a, a healthcare provider telling some happy, clappy story about how great things, great things are. It, it, you know, it makes sense to check whether or not this actually conforms with the reality and how people are feeling on the ground before you run that and make yourself and your publication or your, your news broadcast seem like it's out of touch and doesn't really know what's going on. So, you know, it, this is important. In order to put things in context, I mean, not everything's necessarily distorted, but it might be slightly out of context of the, of the general run of what's happening. It might be that you need to explain further. If, if you get a drug company press release, it's still it's simplified from the drug company's point of view, but it still might need some further work in order to make it understandable uh, to your, your news audience. So you need a critical approach. And I think if we don't train anything else in, journal in journalists to become better health journalists, I think the critical approach is the one thing we absolutely do need to have. Misleading information, as I just said, can cause panic and can impact on health. It can actually make people ill or result in people doing unsafe things or, 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 or very unwise things. So we do need uh, to be careful when we report things which are serious problems. We had, uh, I mentioned the MMR, but we also had, of course, a couple of years back, the global uh, panic over swine flu, which turned out, again, to be relatively restricted in its, uh, in its scope, very, very serious and uh, tragic for those that actually went down with it but not as massive a, a problem as they all said. We had a huge furore in the media back in England around swine flu. And all of the right-wing press, I say the right-wing press, the Daily Mail, the populist press, uh, because it was a Labour government at the time, jumping at and down about how incompetent ministers were that they hadn't spent millions and millions on buying in anti antiviral drugs, like Tamiflu and these other ones. Um, 
And then as the government finally gave, caved in and spent huge sums of money, bought in vast stocks of these drugs, at the same time as the epidemic began to wane, the same papers started to attack them for waste and uh, you know, profligate spending. We wound up with stock and People then finally started to ask questions about whether some of these drugs actually did what they were set up to, to do. It was revealed that Tamiflu only actually saved half a day off a seven-day course of flu. It wasn't a cure, and it, had to, and it had side effects for a significant number of people. And these things started to come out. Eventually, we then went into a very harsh winter in which supplies of grit for the roads ran out. And the same newspapers that had urged ministers to spend billions on these drugs were saying, we've got so much of this stuff unused in stockpiles, why don't we use it to grit the roads because it's not useful for anything else? So you have a complete turnaround by the media, all running on superficial stuff and all potentially, each stage actually potentially misleading in terms of the information that's coming out. So this is, this is important, I think. Okay, so and medical reports, you know, covering medical research, medical developments is really important to get these stories absolutely right. Many of them are based on press releases. The core research in science is often, for, the purposes, for PR purposes, simplified spun for good headlines, to make it dramatic, pick out aspects of the research that maybe are not the main focus of the research, uh, but which appear to be more newsworthy and so forth. So these stories are not necessarily reflective of the actual research that's been done or the findings within that research. And the result can be these exaggerations. You can have the suppression of negative results. Uh, you can have misleading statistics used, as I suggested before. And much of the research conducted by, is, of course, conducted by profit-seeking organizations. They have an agenda. They want to sell their product. They want to make it look like the desirable product. Um, you know, it's, it's one step short of advertising because of what they are doing is using the media and they're relating to the media and they're, they're trading on the fact that the media depends on pro some semi-processed information like this because they no, no longer in many cases have the resources to send people out and get fresh stories. So they're taking advantage of that, but at the same time we have to see that there is that other agenda there. And journalists have to be aware of that, otherwise you do fall... Potentially, you're just going to be an advertising vehicle for the, for the drug companies and, and for the research institutes. And, of course, the universities, they're not in it necessarily for profit, but they do want to raise their profile because they want research grants, they want the prestige of being these groundbreaking institutions and so on. So they have an agenda as well, and you have to read these things critically, and we have to look to get balance these stories. It's really important. Otherwise, we can wind up again just looking like you know, the patsies for these people putting the stuff out. And um, it's rather interesting to see that you can't just accept that because something appears in a peer-reviewed journal, a scientific <coughs> journal, that it's necessarily going to be free from these problems. And uh, the editor of The Lancet, Richard Horton, uh, gave, gave evidence to the uh, House of Commons uh, a few years ago on, on, on this question and, and has writ written and campaigned on it uh, for, for quite a long time. He identifies ten ways in which uh, article material appearing in uh, peer-reviewed journals can actually be a suspect. Is first of all, the actual material you're present, you, uh, that's presented can be uh, the result of manipulated research findings uh, because there's a bias towards positive findings in sponsored studies. So, you know, so uh, the, 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 the temptation is to publish those. The ones that come up with the negative findings tend not to get published. People don't put the articles forward and so forth. You've got undisclosed adverse data, even in something that may be generally a positive uh, report. You've got the, uh, the, the, some of them actively hide negative data and, and, and find ways to obscure it. But, but, you know, very significant is this thing about supplement publishing. Big drug companies, big... Uh, and, uh, th th those, uh, uh, they, they will buy reprints of supplements uh, which are produced around a particular piece of research. Um, but they will only buy it, obviously, if that research is presented in a positive light. They don't want something that's not saying something good about their product. And this means that you can have a very big material incentive as an editor to publish a supplement... Uh, and, and, and to allow this material through uh, in order to ensure that the financial standing of your publication is, uh, is secured. 
and uh, um, uh, Richard Horton described it as well. You know, do I do I publish this thing I'm not so sure about and guarantee another job in my on my editorial desk, or do I stand firm and risk the uh, risk financial problems later on? There's undisclosed conflicts of interest, and uh, uh, Horton. This is Horton's words: the continuing privatisation of much of science threatens to make independent research almost impossible to do. There are so many commercial interests, so many contending commercial interests. Uh, the question of editorial kickbacks. Editors are actually getting offered you know, uh, direct benefits for publishing uh, things which uh, <coughs> that, that they otherwise might not do. Ghost writing, in which pharmaceutical companies seed the literature uh, with these uh, editorials which they write from the company's point of view and then they get someone who puts them to put their name on afterwards. Uh, continuing medical education, uh, which is largely now paid for by industry. So again, if you're reporting these conferences and you're reporting these events, seminars and so forth, uh, uh, then effectively, whether you realise it or not, you are quite often, uh, you're, you're, you're actually participating in, in, in effectively an advertising programme there. So, and failure to align commercial with public interest, which I suppose summarises the whole thing. I mean, this is clearly, the, the journals that we're talking about, they run as businesses now. You know, they're peer-reviewed journals, they have a scientific responsibility, but they still also have to run as businesses. They're part, La, the Lancet is part of Elsevier, which is a profit-making corporation. They charge for their articles. You know, it's, it's, there, there is clearly a, a commercial logic even behind these peer-reviewed journals. So what are the key issues for journalists in being able to do their job well and efficiently? What you want as a health journalist, you want access points for information. You want to know where you can get the information. Um, uh, you know, and, okay, you can then process and, 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 and critique that information. Where can you get it from? Who's going to be talking to you? Who's going to be sending you stuff if you get on the, on the right lists and so on? How can you RS, get RSS feeds and get the material that you need day by day? Timely information. You want information that you can actually use within the timescales you're working to. You don't want to wait around. You don't want to have to you know, uh, put in applications to get responses and so forth. You want to be able to get it uh, there, there and then. And this is particularly important with so few journalists on the case. You don't have a lot of time to turn things around. Certainly if you're working on a website, you, know, you have very little time to get a story from receiving the basic story to getting something online. Uh, otherwise questions are asked. We have a crazy situation back home with a BBC website where people working on there have five minutes to get stories onto the website. And they say, oh, if we find anything's wrong, we'll correct it later. But, I mean, you know, what a way. This is a, an authoritative website that lots of people around the world look to for authoritative information, and yet you just put a press release out and it can be on the, on the website in five minutes. I mean, how many checks can you do in five minutes on anything? Um, there's the range of information you want. If you're looking, if you're reporting a local uh, hospital board um, um, uh, uh, and, and what they're doing, you want the whole of the board's papers, not just the occasional press release summing up some decision from the board's point of view. You want to be able to look. Somebody's saying, well, we're going to be improving these services, but at the same time they've got board papers that show their finances are not looking good and they're going to be looking to cut back on staff in particular areas, for example, to save money then you know that there's something less than straightforward in the press release and you can present it in, in, in that way. So we need a range of information. We need to be able to access the information as, as, as openly as possible. Um, that means you know, we have a big problem back home with a lot of the uh, new organisations that have been set up in the health care reform, uh, the Health and Social Care Act, are, are not bodies which publish um, papers um, which are not subject... Because they don't publish enough information, you can't even frame a question under the Freedom of Information Act to be able to get the information that you want. So the whole question of transparency, all their dealings with private sector organisations are deemed to be business in confidence and they, they claim that the companies won't let them publish this information. We need a way of actually accessing this information so that we can actually inform the public as to what's going on or we need to be pointing out where the transparency is lacking so the public know. You know, we can't check this because nobody will actually give us the information. You know, maybe you should know that we can't access any of the, the, the data on this. We can't check, for example, uh, whether some of these uh, uh, public-private partnerships in uh, Ontario, for example, which haven't been audited, where the papers aren't published, and where the papers they do publish, all the numbers are redacted, so you can't work out whether or not they're value for money. 
So transparency is really important for journalists, I think, and for the public as well. And journalists need informed comment and analysis to balance their stories. So they need public access to information, but they also need to be able to access people who will be prepared to say what they think about it uh, and maybe present a different view on it. There are criteria to measure quality of um, reporting on medical reports and so forth. Uh, I recommend the site healthnewsreview.org if you've not come across it before. This is, uh, the, the, the key guy working on that is the guy called Gary Schweitzer. And uh, they've developed a 10-point checklist to look at the quality of, medical, of reports on medical uh, innovations, new, new techniques, new drugs and so forth, uh, and identify strengths and weaknesses of reports on medical treatment and so on. Uh, I think we need an equivalent for policy. I think we need an equivalent for, for reporting on, on, on issues that, that, that take place in healthcare systems. For example, we've just had a, a very, very complicated piece of legislation passed in England, the Health and Social Care Act. It's a 400-page bill written in parliamentary language. Hardly anybody's read it and lived, you know. I mean, it's, an, it's a, completely, a completely obscure piece of legislation. The reporting of it has been appalling and very one-sided, and, and it's been very difficult for, for anybody in the general public to get an idea of the full content of this, of this piece of legislation. So I think we need to start to look at, you know, how, how can we ensure that the reporting lives up to, uh, lives up to uh, basic uh, requirements? And so these are my ten points. So this is the first time out for these ten points, so I welcome, welcome comments. First off, does the story ask whether there's any concrete plan and timescale for implementation? I wish I had a pound for every time I'd read a pledge that certain services were going to be improved without any proposals as to how this was going to happen, who was going to do it, where the improved services were going to be made available, and so on. You know, it's just crazy. It's just, it's just, it's just not, not, not useful. But we have to ask this question, and if, 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 if we don't ask it that, uh, and, and reveal when there is no clear timescale, then we're failing in, in actually reporting what's going on. Does it explain the costs of the proposals? Identify how it's going to be funded? Does it question whether the policy is based on ideology? You know, in other words, we assume it must be better if we have competition between providers and healthcare, which is a kind of an underlying ideology that we're up against very frequently back in England. Or does it actually seriously address a, a problem that we recognise? You know, how do we address the poor quality of care for older people back home? How do we improve that? Well, you know, is, is competition a good way to do it? We already had a lot of competition in that. Has it improved care of older people? Possibly not. So maybe we need to be looking at how we do address and identify those weaknesses. Um, does it question whether, whether uh, does it seek evidence of the effectiveness of the policy? No, you'd, you would expect that on a medical cure. What's the evidence it actually works? Well, what's the evidence a policy works? Why do we assume it? Is there somewhere it's, it's already been tried and it's proven and so forth? In, if, we, in so, if so, can we show us where? And is it, is it appropriate to try to transfer that here? You know, if it works maybe in, 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 in uh, you know, Indonesia or somewhere, would it work in England? Would it work in Manitoba? You know, they, 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 these are fairly basic questions, uh, but they need to be asked, and they're not often asked. Are the downsides of the policy explored? You know, uh, what, 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 who's going to get left out? What, what resources are going to have to be taken somewhere else in order to make this, this particular policy happen? You need to explore that as well. Does the story unreasonably suggest a consensus in favour? Does it suggest everybody goes along with this and ignore the people who don't? Uh, and again, journalists can be raising these questions publicly. So, you know, we have lots of, uh, lots of this going on back in England. I could give you lots of examples. Are the claimed benefits of the policy explored and questioned? And again, you know, is it really true that, 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 for example, our new health reform is actually going to put GPs, family doctors, in charge of all the decision-making processes in our National Health Service? You know, very few people actually believe this, least of all the GPs, most of, who, uh, most, most of whom opposed it all the way through and won't get involved in the scheme now. Um, but, but, you know, so is it true? Is there a consensus? Or is this just, again, something the government wants you to believe? So are the claimed benefits of the policy explored and questioned? Does the story largely stem from official press releases promoting the policy? Or is there other sources of information uh, that actually give us, give us reason to take the story seriously? Are the potential conflicts of interest explored? You know, is, is the, is the uh, MP or the minister proposing this maybe uh, sponsored by a company that, uh, that, that actually stands to gain from it? 
these type of things are, 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 are relevant, and we, we, have, we have, again, examples around the place. I just find it, our alternative policies discussed. Is this on, the only way there is, there is only one alternative, and so forth, or is this actually looking at a range of different options? So that's my ten, ten suggestions. And I think the key thing about developing, improving healthcare reporting is we're not telling people what to say. We're not telling you how you should report. But we are saying, you know, please, your reporting would be better if you bring a critical approach. You can actually do better for the public. You can do better. You can be more satisfied with the job you do. You can feel more that you're in charge of the information you present if you actually do it in a critical way. Can you break, you can break your dependence on simply repeating official handouts, in some cases just re rewrite it, virtually pasting them into your news thing. You can actually break that dependence if you can start to access alternative sources, if you can start to make that little bit of an effort to draw up your list of alternative contacts that you phone for a quick response and bring in a different take on the stories that you're actually required to process. We can, you know, we can offer links and resources we can do that, obviously, tailored to local circumstances. I don't have links and resources for Manitoba journalists today, but, I mean, we could, we could be working on that. You know, who should you talk to about X or Y's story? We've begun to develop that in, in the UK and, uh, and, and in some of the European countries where we've done these training courses. And this gives journalists their chance to develop their own lists then from that, use them as a base to jump off, develop their own lists, and, and make sure that they're getting independent comment in their articles. And finally, we can, you know, I'm going to stop here because most of the rest of it is self-explanatory in the slides about explaining what we did in the European project, and I want to leave time for questions. But finally, we can actually just demand increased transparency from healthcare commissioners and providers. It's a very important role for journalists. Journalists are the champions of public transparency on these questions. Politicians generally aren't. Politicians generally will only want certain things transparent where it embarrasses their opponents. They will not want to actually open things up more generally for public knowledge. Journalists do have a brief to do that. It can be a very popular role for journalists who are seen as campaigning for the public right to know. And I think this can be also very rewarding for journalists who conduct these campaigns. We've just had one example back home. We had a major report on a hospital scandal in the West Midlands, Mid Staffordshire Hospital. It, uh, it, it, it hit headlines, its poor standards of care resulted in hundreds of patients dying. And anyway, the, the whole thing came to public view because uh, an, an angry relative who was campaigning for this to be uh, exposed finally made contact with a journalist who was the first person to sit down and listen to her. He went back and convinced his editor ran the story, the local paper ran for a press for a, 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 a proper inquiry, a public inquiry. The inquiry was called. This journalist managed to get a sign from his paper to cover every day of that inquiry right the way through. It culminated then at the beginning of this year. Uh, he's now working for the Health Service Journal, a major specialist publication, who also encouraged him to follow it seriously. If that role had not been done by a journalist, those, those facts would not be in the public view now. The pressure for change as a result of those, those, those mistakes, those errors, those, those, those uh, you know, catastrophic errors, that pressure would not be there. So journalism has a role. Journalism can be a real voice for the public, and it's important that journalists see it that way. If we do it that way, just a little, even in the time constraints we have, we can do a better job for us, we can get a more readable publication, and we can get something that does a better service for our readers and possibly at the, end, at the end of the day, even more profits for our employers, which will make us more popular there as well. Who knows? I'm going to stop there. So do we have... Uh, let's stop and uh, see if we have questions here or, or comments. Yeah. Um, it strikes me when you talk about a lot of these problems in, in uh, healthcare journalism that virtually all these problems could be, could be addressed to any sort of other form of journalism, like economics, for example, all these problems are... So I wonder, do you think the solution to this problem is more uh, more training and specialization of journalists into their own uh, topics that they have training and tools to cover, or do you think it's more training in general for journalists to sort of be able to cover these stories without sort of specific training and be able to see through, uh, you know, how, how to report these problems? I'm, I'm a big fan of specialist journalism in general, and I think that actually if you look at the type of jobs that have survived best, um, through the um, 
pressures, the recession and so forth, and the scaling back of newsrooms, it tends to be the specialists who tend to have come through and uh, held on because they have knowledge that's very hard to replace once you, once you lose them. Um, so I think general specialism is, you know, more specialism is good, but I do think health is particularly, um, I think it is unique in that it has this unique breadth. I mean, you know, there's a number of people who are interested in economic journalism, there's a number of people who are interested in environmental journalism, but actually everybody's affected by health. Everybody has a, a stake in health in a way that doesn't apply to almost any other area. People are interested in education, people are, you know, and all of these actually are areas where you do need to follow through things in some detail, and I'm not decrying them at all. But I do think if you're going to start with a specialist area, I think probably health is as, as good one as you can start with. And, you know, again, you're not going to be short of things to write about, and you're not going to be short of an audience uh, for, for, for stories on health. So I, I, I do... I do yeah, but, but, yeah, I mean, I think, generally speaking, uh, journalism education should o offer, as, as, the, as you move towards maybe the end of your of your undergraduate degree, your BA degree, your first degree, maybe should be try, trying to get students to specialise more, to get more into specific areas, they will then write their best stuff and they will get enthused by the material and they will then have more of a portfolio to offer when they're out there in that hard market competing for jobs as well. So that's my... But I'm a fan and I suppose I should declare a vested interest. I teach specialist journalism, you know. I am, that, I am one of those people. But I, I, I really do think... Uh, you know, we also have in Coventry, we also do automotive journalism. And these guys almost all slot into jobs. You know, we, we don't train very many of them. We train about uh, a do, a, a eight or a dozen a year, and they, oh, they're all in demand because they're coming out with the expertise in the industry and everything, and they slot straight into jobs. Now, what we'd like to do is be doing the same thing with, with health, and obviously if we get good at that, maybe we'll start to add some others as well. Yes? Uh, well, I mean, if you take the health professional publications, if you look at the real technical ones, I can't read a lot of those. And I, I, I've never, personally, I've never been a big fan of, uh, I've been, never been very motivated on the writing of medical reports myself. Um, so we do need, obviously, if we're going to get journalists to be able to translate those very technical articles into language that the public can see, we have to have a specialist training in doing that. I mean, we point people towards uh, certain literature and so forth. I mean, we can't do that in the type of courses we've been doing, and we haven't tried to. I wouldn't, I would, but, I mean, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, there has to be a bridge across. If, if, the, if there's not a way in which we can explain this in simple terms, then we shouldn't be putting the stories in the paper. If we have to use terms that people don't understand, or, or just take the already pre-formulated stuff from PR departments who have obviously, you know, they've, 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 they've worked it from their point of view... But if all we're doing is recycling that without actually critiquing it, then I don't think the story should appear in the broad press at all. I don't think they belong there. And you have to be able to stand from what you say, you know, and you have to be able to sort of justify what you say if somebody comes along afterwards. Why did you put that in? You know, how do you know this to be true? Well, I, you know, I, I just thought, you know, I've just read it in a press release. is isn't a very good answer. And I, I actually think that... So, you know, it, it is a challenge... Um, you know, there are some people from the medical profession, there are some people from the scientific trades who are actually quite good at explaining themselves in, 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 in broader terms. And if we can find those who are maybe not got the, uh, the conflict of interest involved in the particular case, then maybe they can help us to do that. And part of the challenge, I suppose, for a journalist is to find one or two of those you can talk to when you need them. I mean, you don't, it's, it's not something you have to do every day, but where you do have something you're really stuck on, you know, you can go to somebody who you can trust and just say, well, you know, just explain this to me, please. And how, how can I put this so that somebody in a bar, you know, uh, on the other side of, uh, uh, of Winnipeg can actually understand it? Because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to talk to the ordinary person. You're not trying to talk to another doctor about it. Otherwise, they just read the original. I have a question. Um, you produced a lot of material on your website, which is, I think, terrific for journalists. How do you see getting it out there? Do you have many people accessing it? What steps have you taken to try and get this more widely understood by journalists? 
Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a little bit of campaigning now um, to actually start to um, build outwards from it. I mean, the, the, the initial program to draw up the training package that we put together was a two-year program. We started by investigating what level of training there currently was, what literature there already was available which might be accessed by health journalists. We found there was very little of both that were of any direct use. Uh, the literature was tended to be very academic and very much not about working journalists and what they actually had to do. Uh, there were very few books about it. In fact, we're, we're now currently working on a book which is trying to plug that, which will be an e-book, which is trying to plug that, plug that gap, uh, which will bring together this training material in, in a kind of more extended form and we'll, all the links will be live and so forth so that people can actually use it as a, a resource in their, in their health reporting. Um, but uh, so, we, we, so we did that. We identified then um, the actual level of training in the newsrooms, as I, as I described, uh, and, and identified that we had a real issue there and, and, and a training need. We then went, and it's, we, in the same survey, we actually asked people of which topics they would most like some additional information and training on. And we broadly defined that, de described those as kind of knowledge and, skill, and skills. Some of them are skills such as, for example, handling statistics and so forth, which are possibly not exclusively around health journalism, but are important skills to have. Um, but other, others were specifically around topics of health journalism. And then we broke them down into, into different training packages and developed those packages for delivery in the, uh, in the partner countries, which we did uh, over the summer of 20. 2012, that's right. And we brought it all together in a conference in Athens uh, in the autumn of uh, uh, 2012, last year. Um, so the stuff is still relatively new. Uh, we put it all online. It's available on, at projectheart.eu, I think it is. Um, I, I'm just trying to remember what the website is for that one. But you can get the same material, the English-based um, material, is all available on the one that I have set up at the same time, which is europeanhealthjournalism.com. Three Ws, europeanhealthjournalism.com. Now, more recently, in England, to take it forward, we've been working with the National Union of Journalists uh, we held one session just before I came away, which is on the structure of the new NHS uh, in England, new National Health Service, and we d gave a briefing for journalists there uh, and, um, and pulled some information together there. And we're now going to be running uh, more information and, uh, and, and a campaign, firstly to get health specialist journalists appointed in each newsroom, and the, the union's going to be doing that, and also to link up the health journalists that we can contact get them obviously where we, hope, where we can into the union, but to get them in, in dialogue and actually create more of it in terms of an online resource that journalists can make use of um, and so forth. So we will be further marketing and promoting the online resources. We've had interest in the European Health Journalism website from all over, from all over Europe and from, uh, and from uh, um, as far afield as India, Philippines, um, people have just found it at random. I mean, I haven't done a lot to actually get it out there, really. It was just there as a parking space so that people could find it, and we could easily give somebody a web, a web address. You can find it all. So you have to register for it. It's free. The register is just to get an idea of who's, who's accessing it and so forth. And then you can just download what you want and, and, and work on it. But I do find, and the journalists that we surveyed found, that they, web resources on their own weren't enough. What they wanted was to actually back it up with uh, discussions and so forth, so you can actually make it come a little bit alive. So, you know, we're hoping that there will be a basis on which we can do more, uh, maybe more training sessions, maybe just more uh, online, uh, interactive like this, uh, in which we can actually uh, uh, get people to discuss rather than simply sit and listen or simply sit and read. And that will make it a little bit more of a live process and a little bit more active process. So that's what we're doing right now. But, I, uh, you know, we would love more international links. We'd love to be linking up with you guys here in Canada, people in, uh, in, in the rest of North America and so on. The Association of Healthcare Journalists does their thing, but they, they charge a, a $40, I think it is, for, if you're not an American or actually from Europe, I think it is, or maybe you, you counted the rest of the world here in Canada. I think it's $40 a, a year membership. That's okay, but, you know, it, it, I, what we really want to do is just reach out and make, put as few barriers up there as possible. So um, the book, we hope, will be out at the beginning of next year and uh, as an e-book, and obviously we'll pass on that information through to 
evidence.ca and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be hoping that more people will be in touch. Do we have any other? No? Yes? Do you think there's a way to involve uh, health journalists, medical journalists, with journalists in other fields, for example, sports? I'm thinking, for example, in, in North America in the last year there's been a growing coverage of a problem, the problem of concussion and deaths from brain injury uh, from hockey players and football players. Owners of the teams don't want the coverage. The leagues don't want the coverage, but it's been journalists largely who've been pushing it. And I think it's a very interesting area, maybe for some growth in these things. Yeah, I mean, you know, all, all these things that cross over, you know, get, get a greater number of people interested, and you know, whole discussion about what the implications of some of these brain injuries might be. You know, what's the treatment for people with serious brain injuries and so on. I mean, there's a big discussion. I, in my other incarnation at Coventry University, I teach health policy, and we've had. At the end of this, that, as that assessment, it's a module, it's lasted one term. At the end of it, the students write an assessment. And in the last uh, five or six years, we've had three students, each separately doing studies on what the services are for people with long-term brain injury. And some very interesting stuff. But, you know, the question of how people get brain injury is obviously a good story. I mean, how else, how else do people do it? I mean, not just in sports. Um, and obviously, these are people who years ago would have died. Uh, the, the medical technology wasn't there to keep them alive. They would have just died. Uh, but they're now alive, but impaired, in a, you know, and, and obviously rather limited options. What should be done? How, how could the services be improved? What resources are available? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you take cases that people are aware of, high-profile cases, and you can follow it through, and you get a really interesting story then about how the whole system fits together. I'll just give a plug for Evidence Network because we actually, I was in a discussion with John last night saying that we really want to have this material available and you know we're trying to put together resources for journalists and I think it's some of the best stuff I've seen well, thank you. I mean, I, th I think you know, what, when we sat the journalists down to discuss, for example, health policy, you know, everybody thinks they know a little bit about health policy if you're reporting on health uh, issues. Uh, but we just started to sort of broaden it out. And, 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 and I have to be very careful because in my other life as, as, a, as a, actually a health journalist, I am a campaigner. I actually work for a health campaign with distinctive critiques of the government. And I had to really work at it to make sure that what we were doing was getting people to look in general terms and just ask questions rather than I was giving them, trying to give them the answers, which I wasn't, you know. Because I want journalists to think about it. I don't necessarily want them all to agree with me. I want them to think about what they're saying and make sure that they've actually asked all the questions that can get the right answers. Because at the end of the day, you know, that, that we're going to depend on that. I mean, I can only go and lobby so many of them at once. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 you know the, the information out there you know, public deserve a little bit better than some of the stuff they've been getting. And the other thing that came out in these surveys that we did across Europe was that most health journalists are pretty critical of the stuff that they and their colleagues actually produce. Very few of, this, of the areas of uh, health reporting came out well in scores in terms of the confidence people had in the quality of that, that journalism. Now, that's a pretty sad state of affairs. You know, people are working at a job and they, they don't rate the quality of what is put out. I mean, it, it wasn't clear whether they were rank, ranking their own material or, the, or just entirely criticising their colleagues. But the point is that this was, this was a, a pretty general view. East to west in Europe, up north to south, people didn't think health reporting was actually very good. It might be interesting to get some similar questions raised in Canada. What do you think of the quality of reporting on, for example, the business and economics of healthcare? Uh, which is another very interesting topic to start opening up. You know, what are the commercial interests involved? What, what is the scale of the actual business of healthcare? It'd be interesting to know, you know, Canada-wide, province-wide, how these, how these things break down. And, uh, you know, it can be an interesting exercise to work it through and just ask yourself some different type of questions about it and maybe open up some different areas in which stories can be written.